The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, it's about edible flowers, why you should grow them and why you should eat them, as well as container gardening. Our guest will be new author Susan Mulville will be with us and will answer your garden questions. And it all starts right now. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Welcome to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Happy you are part of the program today. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow. We thank you for tuning in, whether you're listening to us on one of the 15 stations that are broadcasting our program this year in 2021, Radio App, through our parent website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, under the Season 5 tab, in-studio video replay or podcast or any other way, we thank you for allowing us to be part of your day. If you want to get a hold of us, here's how you can do that. You can send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Write that down so you always have that available. Or you can give us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW. 1-800-927-SHOW. If we can't get to you, leave a message and we will get back to you with the problem or your situation resolved the best that we can give it to you. So, Holly, let's get in the program. And our first topic today is a topic that I have not really heard a lot of people cover, which is edible flowers. Now, why would one want to have edible flowers? And what's the? And then we'll go into what they taste like, I guess, is kind of the, the, the outline here. Well, it's always been a thing, but now it's becoming even more of a thing with the whole... Uh, farm to table movement over the past few years and just um, in general like a lot of these smaller restaurants will add the flowers as a garnish or just like a little accent piece to the dish kind of add a uniqueness to whatever they're whatever they're serving well many many years ago back uh, when the restaurant Ponderosa was available uh, that's more of a southern thing Bonanza was more of a northern thing wasn't there both, there's Ponderosa here. Uh, well, in the northern areas of the country, maybe you're in an area where there's still a Ponderosa or Bonanza. But anyway, the story goes: uh, whenever we would go, we would always there would always be a garnish on the dish. Which now, looking back, it was the it was kale, curly kale. Yeah. And nobody ate it but me. You're not right. you weren't supposed to eat that. That was supposed to be like just a no no. On our first date, you said some something about the garnish and how kale. I think it was parsley on my yeah. dish because I had like some Italian dinner thing and you said kale is better and i was like okay dude (laughs) well (laughs) well now here we are now if you add kale with bacon and a little of walton seasoning uh you got something going on there so let's go over some of the do's and don'ts here before we actually get into some of the more common and to me doing research on this didn't realize some of these were edible yeah well that's the thing is that you might not know and you have to be cautious you want to make sure you are eating the correct thing Um, but one thing is definitely do not eat it if it was sprayed with pesticides. So you might know like in your yard or your garden that it wasn't, but if you're driving down the side of the road, a state park, yeah, you don't know what has been sprayed. So one of the, we're not going to really cover this a lot, but one of them is phlox. And I know phlox grows on the side of the road. Um, you wouldn't want to eat that. Well, some of these things, if they are sprayed, they probably are not going to survive that spray because it's a toxicity spray that's designed to kill yeah, some like of an herbicide or something right yeah so yeah that's one thing and then you want to use them sparingly a lot of these can cause digestive issues if you were going to eat like i don't know like a whole clover salad or something right so you want to make sure it is definitely like an accent garnish uh mix you, it in yeah mix it in type of thing so let's talk about the first one which is clover now are we talk in the white clover we see in the yard or we're talking about the red clover that people are bailing up for the animal uh feed in the fields the white and red clover blossoms okay yeah so not the uh the animal feed so um you can add it to salads 
and it has a uh, almost like a licorice like flavor. Well, that won't be something you will enjoy. No, you don't like licorice. Uh, next thing is dandelions. Now, dandelions in some portions of the area in which we are from, uh, you go ten miles one way, the dandelions are just now blooming. You go ten miles the other way, they've already bloomed. They got the little puffers on them. However, uh, all parts of the dandelion are edible except for the stem. Uh, they can the stem can be toxic, and the flower, the root, the leaf. Now, it's not something that you're going to go, hey, the family's over. Let's have a whole meal of dandelions. That's not, there's different properties and benefits to different parts, parts of the plant. And people do stuff with the roots. They make a, They boil it, and, and I've heard. And like a tincture, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. supposed to be, a, uh, helps with your blood. Now, we're not physicians, or we don't play them on TV or the radio, so don't take it, you know, talk right. with your we're physician. Not, yeah. We're not doctors, we're not nutritionists, we're not... Um, anything like that. So definitely want to to keep that in mind. Do your research and make sure you are identifying what you are eating. That's our disclaimer. Right. Um, so another one is impatience. A lot of people use these and they, they has a sweet Hurry up, flavor. I'm impatient. Let's move through. That's a, they have a sweet flavor. They can be used as a garnish or like a, they float in drinks. Uh, is the whole thing edible or just the flower? The flower. Okay. Mm -hmm. Marigolds. Yeah, so people use this for We like, know rabbits like them. Yeah. <laughs> People use them like saffron, and I think that they're in the same family. Um, and like, like a lot of people, I guess they have a citrus fa flavor, and people like them in salads. Okay, uh, so that that's a, something that many people don't realize that are realize it is something that you can eat is the um, marigolds, dandelions. Many people w may have been familiar. Side note on the dandelions: there's over 300 varieties of dandelions in the world, and there's no copycats, meaning that there's no secondary plant that mimics the plant of the dandelions that uh, that you can misidentify. Oh, that's Th good. There are some plants out in the world where plant A is edible, but plant B is a copycat that looks very, very similar to plant A, but plant B is toxic, and if you eat it, you're not going to be very well off. Wow. So you've got to be very well identifiable on these plants. And there's uh, bushcraft people and outdoors people that know very, very well these plants by specific identification traits on the leaves or the stem or where it's specifically growing under a tree next to a riverbank. What, you know, there are certain things that this plant will only do this. And they know this from just experience. It's like folklore kind of yeah, like, uh, yeah, just like passed down from well, like native Americans. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What's next on our list here? Mm, I don't know how to say that. I, you say it right. Nasturtiums? Nasturtiums, that's it. Okay. All right, so this is, a lot of people know about nasturtiums and how they are edible. Um, the blossoms have a sweet, spicy flavor, like watercress, and people will make, um, stuff the flowers, like, with mousse, or you can add it to salads, pickle them. There's all sorts of use, uses for nasturtiums. Um, pansies is the next one on our list. Yeah, so you only eat the petals. Okay, so the, um, so the, the that's the only part that's safe to consume is mm -hmm. the petals. Okay, and some people use them as a garnish in fruit salads, green salads, desserts, or in soup. Oh, okay. Tulips is another one, and it's just tulip petals. Yeah, so a lot of people have a sensitivity to the tulip petals, so you might want to, um, I guess, make sure if you touch the tulip petals and you get like a itchy hand. Then you're likely don't eat it. That, yeah, don't eat it. Um, but a lot of people add those again in salads um, with baby peas or um, anything like cu they go well with cucumbers. Uh, another one is violets. Yeah, so violets have a, a perfume flavor. Um, if you if you're out and you smell violets, you'll you'll kind of get an idea of what they could possibly taste like. Kind of like when people you know make the lavender lemonade, mm -hmm. you know it's going to have that lavender earthy. Um, you better you, flavor. You you know if you are going to like it or not just yeah. by the, the the fragrance that you're ingesting through your nostrils. Right. So that's the same thing with violets. They have a very sweet perfume flavor, not the same as lavender, but you would know if it's something you're gonna like. And a lot of people use this to embellish like desserts, drinks. Um, people well, will we freeze see, them. We'll see. You know, when we watch the the moving picture box, uh, we see people. That's the TV, Holly. Uh, we see. People, you know, when we watch the cake shows, they use a lot of petals in decorative fashion on cakes that, that, that are edible. Wedding cakes and, and different fashion cakes, uh, they'll use the petals on that. So that's where some of it can be incorporated. But many people uh, may choose to use it in a salad 
or garnish other di- uh, items with it. And some people will will take the violets and cook them like spinach. So they kind of cook them down um, and saute it so that it's like spinach. Okay, and possibly add other flavors in with it. Yeah, you probably would want to add something else like oil, you know, cooking oil well, or it- seasoning. What have you? I'm if sure. you're if you're vegetarian and vegan, not bacon. If you're not a vegetarian and vegan, ba- I wasn't going to say bacon. I, that's why I disclosed. Some people <laughs> enjoy it. Other people do not for personal or religious reasons. Yeah. So there's some a list of just a, a, and then one, yeah, I mean one obvious one is is the sun the sunflower yes. seeds. But I just want to mention that because I think sometimes people don't always think about that. They might grow sunflowers and then they just, you know, throw them in their compost and they might not think about the seeds. Mm -hmm. So just keep that in mind. And sometimes you have to get them before the squirrels do. Well, I saw a video online and you know how accurate that is, but it was from a reputable seed company and they took the giant mammoth sunflower right at the time it blossomed open Mm -hmm. and they knocked off the the petals and then they uh, fried it on a, like a hot plate and then rubbed it with uh, sun-dried tomatoes. Oh, and they good. ate it like that. It was like yeah, you, know. you can eat the petals of sunflower. Also, no, zucchini- they were eating the whole oh, thing. Yeah, they, yeah. Zucchini blossoms. Yes. Um, we can't forget about those. A lot of people will eat those. They'll deep fry them. If you have an abundance, you could use a zucchini blossoms. Right. So, with that said, uh, maybe it's something that you did not know that you had in your own yard or on your own property. A number of these flowers in which you can consume and add towards a dish or a snack. Well, something else in which you can incorporate into your meals is products from Walton's Incorporated, whether you are taking it from uh, animal to edible or you just need a little spicing up the meat that you purchase from the store. So the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you today by our sponsor, Walton's Inc. We know you care about where your food comes from. Canning and preserving your fruits and vegetables is great. But with the meat, waltonsinc.com has you covered. They have all the equipment, seasoning, supplies to make sausage, jerky, any other meat product your way to your high standards. You want to make snack sticks that people will actually like. Walton's created meatjustics.com, an inform- informational site to help you make the best finished product. Walton's even has a full line of their own meat grinders, mixers, and sausage stuffers to help you go from animal to edible. Walton's, everything but the meat. When we come back, it's going to be all about container gardening. What you may know, what you may not know, but we're going to get everybody on the same page so we can have a successful container garden in addition to other types of gardening that you may do on your property. You're listening to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. If you love growing tomatoes, then you have to try Tomato Secret by Dr. Jim's. At the Gardening with Joey and Holly Radio Show Gardens, we stand behind Tomato Secret and recommend it to all gardeners who would like to easily grow higher quality tomatoes with more color, flavor, less bugs, and diseases. Tomato Secret is specifically designed to grow high quality tomatoes, and it's made with 12 natural ingredients so pure you could feed them to a cow. Simply apply one cup in the hole at planting, then sprinkle one cup around the plant one month later. That's all it takes to grow the best tomatoes on earth. With this product, you'll not have to guess what's wrong with your tomato plants because it has everything they need. Grow the largest and most delicious tomatoes on earth. To find out more about Tomato Secret, visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z dot C-O-M. Deer Defeat is an all-natural repellent to keep deer, rabbits, and groundhogs away from your precious plants. Deer Defeat protects your plants day and night, dries clear, and odorless. It will not clog your sprayer. Deer Defeat works for 30 days through rain, snow, and freeze. Safe, effective, and works on rabbits. Money-back guarantee. To purchase, go to DeerDefeat.com and use code RADIO to save 10% on your order. Deer Defeat. It can't be beat. Do you know there's a real Tiger Torch? Visit TigerTorchLTD.com for more information. Rinse kit. Pressurized water on the go. No pumping, no battery. Simply fill from your spigot or sink on the way out for up to five minutes of spray time. Anywhere. Live dirty. Rinse clean with Rinse Kit. 
If you could double the life of your raised bed boxes by sealing the wood with a clear non-toxic wood preservative, would you? Well, now you can with a clear penetrating product called internal wood stabilizer. It's 100% non-toxic and easy to apply. Seal your untreated wood surfaces, even chicken coops, by spraying on internal wood stabilizer. It's invisible, seals the wood from the inside out, and never wears off. Recommended by organic gardening experts, internal wood stabilizer. Check it out at TimberProCoatingsUSA.com. Seed Savers Exchange has been saving, preserving, and sharing heirloom seeds since 1975, and today continues to provide those seeds for gardeners just like you. They have over 600 varieties. Visit SeedSavers.org to request a free catalog or to purchase seeds online for this year's growing season. That's SeedSavers.org. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. Rootmaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit Rootmaker.com. Use coupon code RADIO21 and get 15% off your entire order. We've been using a game-changing tool called SeedLinked to find and review our seeds this year. It makes finding the right seeds simple. It is driven by growers' data so you can really see what's best for your location. Check it out at SeedLinked.com or download the mobile app today. Soul Brew Kombucha is founded and handcrafted in Milwaukee, 100% organic, formulated for ultimate health and enjoyment. Find out the benefits of drinking kombucha and where to purchase at MySoulBrew.com or find them on Facebook at MySoulBrew. The Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Simply Earth, Seed Savers Exchange, Quick Snap Sprinklers, Water Hoop, Timber Pro Coatings, Bloom and Easy Plants, Pomona Universal Pectin, Ivy Organics, Tiger Torch, Happy Leaf LED, Seed Link. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Happy you're with us today. You know, if uh, a lot of places in the country are starting to develop and have been going through a drought, and it's only getting worse in many parts of the country, and Tree Diaper is willing to help and provide us with a little help in order to keep our plants watered. I think we're in a drought, technically. Yes, we are. Yeah, so the drought situation is getting worse in the U.S. So to help gardeners, they're going to offer 20% off the Garden Mat GM36. One two, from May sixteenth to June fifteenth. So for regions already in drought, there may be no rain to catch. So what you want to do is you want to soak the tree diaper in water for five hours before installation, and then you check the soil moisture. Um, there they use sell soil mo- moisture meter once a week, and then in their trial in Central Virginia, they only had to water once a year. So for regions that the regions that still have a lot of rain before the dry season, it will automatically charge up with rain before slowly releasing it back. Free shipping on orders over 100. That's treediaper.com. Again, that's treediaper.com. Uh, for more information, you can uh, call them at 540-300-1465. If you need more information, you can get a hold of treediaper.com or send an email to us at garden talk radio at gmail.com and we'll send you all the information so you can get the best deal possible and keep your plants growing all season long well speaking of plants growing you can grow them in containers and tree diaper has devices in which works very well in containers as well but many people uh maybe new gardeners this year or last year and they just are not familiar with some of the things that more veteran gardeners have learned when it comes to growing in containers. Yeah, you and I actually have quite a history of container gardening. Yes, we do. Yeah, we do. That was our first gardening together uh-huh. experience. Um, we had grown our, our own separately, and then we grew in containers together. So there's some things that we need to know uh, when it comes to containers. What do you want to grow? Which determines the next point, the size of the container that you're going to grow it in. Right. So you you want to grow something like a tomato plant or a pepper plant or an eggplant. You want to grow in about a container about the size of a five-gallon bucket. Right. Now, 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 disclaimer here, that is true. 
However, if you're growing like a tiny Tim tomato that gets 16 inches tall, we, we grow them in, indoors year-round in the one-gallon grow bags from RootMaker.com. You can right. use coupon code RADIO21 to save 15% on your order. Uh, they got grow bags, raised beds. they got a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, but it determines that. now. Right. So you want, something that you want to kind of take into consideration, you may be growing a and, tomato. And, right. And a container yeah. is just not a little cup that you put on your windowsill. Containers can be a 60-gallon grow bag. Mm-hmm. It can be a raised, uh, a raised bed with a bottom on it. That and, is can, is a container, right? And that's the thing is that you you determine the size of the container, right? Um, but a lot of people like them because you can put them, you know, in a on a patio. You maybe you have like a um, you have limited sunlight, but you can put them alongside your driveway or something. You can't dig in the ground, but you can put all the containers you want on the ground based on. Of many factors, right? That your conditions are, you know, whatever, whatever your deal is, and you're not limited to just like, um, you know, a certain size container as you had mentioned, right? But if you want some sort of aesthetic, that might be something that you want to consider. So to keep that in mind. Now, a big thing is drainage holes, and and Joey likes to d- drill his drainage holes along the bottom side, right? Uh, let example, all of us vision, uh, take a vision and think about a five-gallon bucket. Most people put holes in the bottom of the five-gallon bucket. However, if you go up the side about one inch and put four holes around the perimeter of that bucket, that and then fill it up. Don't add rocks or pour anything else in the bottom. Just put fill it up with compost, uh, potting soil, raised bed mix. And then when you when it rains or you water, it overflows after that bottom one inch is saturated And then that allows the excess water to set there and wick back up in the soil as the plant needs it to kind of give you a little insurance if it is a really hot day and um, you forget to water or you just don't can't get to the watering aspect of it. Now, when we talk about that, if you go full bore on the uh, containers, uh, DripWorks.com has a couple of a couple of container irrigation kits in which you can set up on your patio porch or deck that's designed specifically for containers. Uh, So that works very well. But also now, back to your thing, is a container can be any size you want it to be. However, a five-gallon bucket is easy to move compared to a 60-gallon grow bag once you put it where you want it, uh, or you think you want it, that's and you fill it up. That's pretty much all it is, unless you take a half, you know, a couple hours to dig all that soil out and move it somewhere else. Right, that's definitely something to keep in mind. And if you have kids and maybe you want to do, you want to delve into gardening, but you don't want to delve into it huge, you can grow small containers and then you give each kid their own little plot of containers or whatever. And I guarantee those kids are going to take that container and show their friends or whoever. So that's something to keep in mind. As well. Um, so another thing is, what what kind of soil do you put in there? Don't dig soil out of the ground. <laughs> right, don't dig soil out of the ground. And, and we joke about that, but that's true. Some people ha- do go that route. Now, the reason why you don't want to go that route is because it's too compacted. It will basically, uh, even when you water it, it's still very, very dense. And when you forget to water, or you, you water on a regiment, but it dries out, it becomes concrete. Uh, now, in the ground... In the physical ground, it doesn't do that because there is a lot of activity, earthworms, microscopic uh, microbes. There's a lot of stuff keeping that soil to a level of looseness to allow things to, to work through it. In a container, you've elevated it up, and you don't have a lot of that activity going on. Right. So you want to use um, – uh, there are container mixes. Yes. Some people make their own container mixes. You can use a raised bed mix. You can grow in some sort of natural, like a leaf compost or just any other type of compost. And you don't have to add worms when you're adding good no, soil. You People, don't. if the worm eggs are in the compost, raised bed mix, potting soil mix, and they make it in your bucket or your grow bag, fine and dandy. But do not specifically go and dig worms up and put in there because worms, uh, they... In the ground, if it's too wet, they go down. If it's too dry, they you know they move around. And in a thirty in a five gallon bucket, there's only so much room. And most of them, if all of them, will die eventually. Right, and that's something to to definitely keep in mind. Um, so you got you have that, and then something you want to ke- also keep in mind is you need to water these containers, and you want to water them, at, especially during the peak of the summer. You might have to water them twice a day, and definitely at least once a day. If it's if you got to if we've for some reason are out of the drought and have a lot of rain, then that might be different, but you definitely want to 
keep them in mind unless you had like a huge uh uh 60 is it 60 gallon 60 gallon container versus like a five gallon right and then we also if you're growing something like cucumbers which can be done in a bucket can be done in a 10 gallon grow bag can be done in smaller than what you believe what what you might believe uh you want some type of way of vertically uh letting them grow vertical because a cucumber plant will produce about twice as many cucumbers if it is allowed to grow vertical versus horizontal across the ground Bees can get in there to pollinate. Uh, for your convenience, you're able to see the cucumbers much easier, and you're able to pick them at an, at an acceptable size to allow that plant to continue to reproduce those cucumbers because we've all done it, and if you haven't, we'll tell you the story so you don't do it. You let them grow on the ground, and they're they're very thick ground cover, and then all of a sudden you find one that's you know, twice the size of a football, and that plant is beginning to, has already shut down because its job is to mature the seeds inside of that uh fruit or inside of that cucumber and it doesn't care if you're wanting cucumbers or not so it shuts down after the job is done of maturing the seeds you want to pick your cucumbers when they are a uh, cucumber we're talking about cucumbers here uh since we're talking about it. uh small frequently and do not let them get yellow or white right bonus um, tip there <laughs> bonus tip um so now you maybe you ask okay i have con- i started gardening last year and i have containers do i have to dump all the soil out Add new soil and no and yes. So if you had like a one gallon container, you would want to add fresh soil. But if you have something like a five gallon container or larger, you can dump about a third of the soil out and then just refresh that soil. And whenever you fill these containers up with whatever mix that you're using, go ahead and add an organic fertilizer to that mixture. Now we want to talk, we talk about organic because it's safe for you, safe for the environment, safe for your pets, and it doesn't you know, the plants are not jumping and sucking it all up at once. They can pick it up as they need it. Uh, but we don't want to go something very large numbers. There's three numbers on a bag of a fertilizer. You don't want to do a triple 30 or a triple 20 in a container because with, you know, it's not like we're growing in South Florida where we have a tremendously long grow season. We've got a short grow season. And by using two, you know, a number that high, the plant's not going to be able to utilize all that nutrients, and there's no point of putting more in there than the plant can pick up because you're just wasting your money and your time and materials and the whole deal. Right. <clears throat> so that being said, uh, if you've got any container uh, problems, we're certainly able to uh, help you with them uh, at Garden Talk Radio at gmail.com. Uh, one but, thing, one thing. Yes. You can trellis or stake or whatever in a container. Just because you're growing in a container doesn't mean you cannot. Right. Yep. Now that the weather is warming up, uh, we want to protect our gardens as well as our yards from those various beetles, weevils, boars, those Japanese beetles, yes. Right. And so what better way to prevent these pests from destroying your garden than by controlling them while they are larvae? Grub Gone is an easy-to-apply granular product that can spread on your turf to successfully control grub invaders. It's developed by Phylum Bioproducts from a naturally occurring bacteria. Grub Gone is a non-chemical BT product that specifically targets only certain scarab pests, and it's safe to use around bees and other beneficial insects. If you have those beetles already flying around your yard, then Beetle Gone is the answer. It is the is an organic water dispersible powder that you can spray directly on your edible plants. Yes, directly on your edible plants. Find out more at phylumbioproducts.com. That's P-H-Y-L-L bioproducts.com. When we come back, new author Susan Mulville will be with us talking about bugs. You're listening to the Gardening with Join Holly radio show, a program to help your garden grow better. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now, 1-800-927-SHOW. You move your lawn sprinklers all over the yard, but you always end up putting them in the same spots. Why not just bury them there? Out of sight, always ready to use, pre-adjusted to water the precise areas you want. Quick Snap Sprinklers makes it easy. In-ground sprinklers without the hassle or expense of laying pipe. Put the sprinklers anywhere in your lawn or garden. Snap on a hose to supply the water. Water on, it pops up. Water off, it drops below ground. You can mow right over it. You can have a buried sprinkler system up and running in just minutes. Each quick snap saves thousands of dollars. They install in minutes and operate for years. Visit quicksnapsprinkler.com. 
This week's garden tip is brought to you by Yard Glider, the cart without wheels, loads without lifting, hauls more, dumps faster, built to last, and built for hard work. Multiple sizes available at yardglider.com. That's yardglider.com. Compost tea is an easy item which you can make and has great benefits for your garden. Simply take a five gallon bucket, fill it full of water. If you have chlorinated water, let that set for 24 hours and then put one shovel full of completed compost in the bucket. Stir twice a day and then within a week you'll have compost tea. You can use it as a foliar feed or water the plants with it. You can separate the water from the solid to make it easier to go through your pump sprayer. This week's garden tip was brought to you by Yard Glider. The cart without wheels, loads without lifting, hauls more, dumps faster, built to last, and built for hard work. Perfect for homeowners, arborists, hunters, landscapers. Pull it behind an ATV, a lawnmower, or pull it yourself. Multiple sizes available at YardGlider.com. That's YardGlider.com. Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit ProPlugger.com. How would you like to be able to fertilize, aerate, and dethatch your lawn using just one product and at the same time improve the soil and root development? Introducing Lawn Force 5, a five-way lawn care kit in a bottle. Lawn Force 5 gives you a lush and healthy lawn you can be proud of. And it takes away the expense of hard work that comes with mechanically aerating and dethatching the lawn. Visit our friends at natureslawn.com to find out more about the amazing Lawn Force 5 product. That's natureslawn.com. Use discount code GARDEN-TALK for 10% off your order. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. Make watering easy. DripWorks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the U.S. and Canada. Purchase online at DripWorks.com. The Water Hoop is a portable water sprinkler system that allows you to target water evenly around the root ball of your tree or bush. Conforms to various shapes for your watering needs. The Water Hoop reduces runoff and saves money. Visit waterhoop.com. Straight from the farm, fields, and briar patch, Piper and Leaf Artisan Tea is a tea like you've never imagined it. Get our award-winning tea delivered right to your front door and become part of the Piper and Leaf family. Free shipping over $75 at Piper and Leaf. Dot com. Good bugs to eat bad bugs. Rinconvitova.com. Call or email today. 1-800-248-BUGS. The Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Pro Plugger. Dripworks. Walton's Incorporated. Tree Diaper. Janie's Mill. Phylum Bioproducts. Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated. Nature's Lawn and Garden Incorporated. Deer Defeat. Dr. Jim's. Root Maker. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Thank you for being with us. Do you have carpenter bees? We've, we've asked you this question a couple of times in the last uh, month, but we're trying to uh, prevent the problem on your property before the carpenter bees do the damage, and then you've got an expense, and especially with lumber prices now, you don't want to have any expenses when it comes to damage to lumber. Correct. So carpenter bees, there's a carpenter bee trap stick from Rescue. It also works on wasps, mud daubers, and what they do is they bore holes and tunnels into wood to lay eggs and care for their larvae. So these holes and tunnels are in the wood. They invite mold and rot into homes, decks, fences, and other wood structures. Spring is the best time to catch carpenter bees before they mate, but trap stick can be used throughout the summer and early fall to control the carpenter bees. Rescue makes the carpenter bee trap stick. It's simple to use and pesticides free. You hang the trap stick from the wood structures if that you want to protect. You go to carpenterbeecontrol.com. You watch a video about carpenter bees and learn how to prevent them with the trap stick from rescue. That's rescue.com or carpenterbeecontrol.com. And they're made in the USA. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Susan Mulva Hill is a columnist, passionate gardener, author, and has a new book out called The Vegetable Gardener, Vegetable Garden Pest Book. Welcome to the program, Susan. Thank you very much. Well, we want to, we, let's just get into it. We often get a lot of questions, and, and you may as well uh, also. What is this insect on X plant? What are some great ways for people 
to identify a pest that's in their garden the most effective way? Well, we all carry our phones with us at all times, right? Right. So take a photo of the bug so you can zoom in on it to see what it actually looks like. Then do a web search using a description of the bug's appearance. So let's say yellow and black striped beetle. And look at the images in the results until you find something that looks about right. You'd be amazed at how well this works. But another thing I wanted to suggest is to join an insect ID group on Facebook or other social media and post a photo of the bug because they are great at identifying insects for you. There's also a great bug identification website called bugguide.net and there are other ones as well, but I use that one, it's amazing. And then be sure to ask your local Master Gardener program to help you identify the bug because they are a great resource and their service is free. That's definitely very helpful. So what are some tips to determine if damage to a plant is from a pest versus something else? It can be challenging at times, that's for sure. So damage from animals is usually pretty startling because they tend to take big bites. And sometimes they even pull up the whole plant, which is really annoying. If the top of the plant is missing, I would look for things like deer, rabbits, or woodchucks. And look for their droppings because that can help with identification. Birds peck at the leaves, so there can be a lot of damage, but it's usually in the form of small bites or missing foliage. If you go out to your garden and a covey of quail flies out of there or you spot some turkeys, I certainly would suspect them first. But most insects cause holes or maybe small half moon circles on the leaves or they chew plant stems. More often than not, what you're going to do, need to do is some sleuthing on or around the plants to see if you can find some bugs. If you don't have any luck, go out into your garden at night with a flashlight to see if you spot some because there are many bugs that are nocturnal, meaning they're only active at night. Now, with your experience, you've been a gardener for a very long time. What has bu uh, been a bug or bugs that you have uh, been challenged with? Oh, boy. Uh, pill bugs. Those are considered a benign pest or a benign insect, I should say, because they help with the decomposition of organic matter. But they also have a dark side. <laughs> <laughs> they love to chew on the stems of young uh, cucurbits like melons, cucumbers, squash, pumpkins. And that's because the stems are so succulent. So I did have a problem with some pill bugs, I didn't know at the time, chewing on some young seedlings that I had just planted. And I came out the next day and here's one laying on its side and here's another one with some damage and wilting leaves. And I thought, oh, those darn slugs, it's gotta be the slugs. And I put out some slug bait, I tried different things, nothing was solving the problem. So I went out at night with a flashlight and here's some pill bugs chowing down on the lead or the uh, stems of the seedlings. And so I thought, ha ha, I know what that is. <laughs> and, and I'm glad you brought that up because there was a, a, a debate on one of the gardening Facebook pages that I was following. And they were saying exactly the same thing. Oh, pill bugs or roly polies, they don't chew anything. And the, and the person who was Plating the case was, well, yes, they do because it did all this damage. So I'm glad you pointed that out. Yes. And I think I saw the same post because I weighed in on that one just because of my past experience. Right. So your book is the Vegetable Garden Pest Book. What is something unique or noteworthy in your book that would encourage our listeners to check it out? In addition to providing over 200 photos showing bugs and the damage they cause, I created a massive diagnostic chart to help gardeners determine which pests are damaging their plants. So here's how it works. You start by going to the name of the vegetable crop you're growing. So let's say it's broccoli. Then you read through descriptions of the types of damage that bugs might cause on broccoli plants. 
when you find something that matches the damage you're seeing, you'll notice the name of a pest or pests that cause that type of damage. And that will point you to the detailed profiles of those pests, which also contain lists of organic methods for controlling them. This is such a great tool for gardeners. Now, you you clearly with with all with the book, there has been a massive amount of time that's been invested in order to make these uh, make all these possible. How long and how much time did you put into creating a book this detailed to help gardeners, uh, beginner or advanced, across the country? Well, and thanks for pointing that out because it's it's not for just one region; it's for all over the place. And um, I started writing the book last February of 2020, and I submitted the manuscript in the middle of September last year. So several months, but I had been thinking about doing a book like this for quite a while. And so I already, you know, I had some material, but yes, I did a ton of research because I think it's so important to be very accurate. What? And right. information that they can rely on. Right. And and if you, I've got a problem with cabbage, I can go to that portion of the book and start basically doing a, a search. Here's what the problems is. And you've narrowed it down for me. Uh, your work has made my job much easier identifying the problem in my garden so I can be successful. That's awesome. Well, that's great. So we're talking with Susan Mulva Hill. Uh, she's an author, columnist passionate gardener and she's she's a new book out called the vegetable garden pest book so why is organic pest control important even though chemical pesticides are easy to come by they are non-selective that means that in addition to killing the type of insect that's causing a problem in your garden they will also kill beneficial insects that prey on that pest in addition, the residue from those chemicals remains on the produce we're growing and can also persist in the soil. Now, I personally grow my own food because I want to know it's safe, I want to know it was handled carefully, and I don't want chemicals to play a role in their growth. So by taking an organic approach, all of us can embrace the environment that exists in our gardens. That's that's definitely very helpful. Um, and what is integrated pest control management and how does it work? Well, even though it has a long name, it's a systematic approach to pest problems that we should all be using on a regular basis because it makes a lot of sense. The goal is to use solutions or control methods that have the least impact on the environment. The first step, which we all need to do, and it's so simple, is to monitor our gardens on a regular basis. That way, we'll spot potential problems right away. If you see bugs on your plants, identify what they are, because they might be beneficial insects, so you certainly wouldn't want to kill them. If they turn out to be pests that are damaging your vegetables, select a method for controlling them. And you'll find all sorts of methods in my book and then implement it. At that point, document the steps you took and what your solution was so that you'll remember what worked or what you should do differently if you have problems with that same pest again. With traditional integrated pest management, the final step, if nothing else has worked, is to use a chemical control but I just can't bring myself to do that. So I don't even consider that an option. I go organic the whole way. Well, now, Susan, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, in a garden, you're going to have good bugs and bad bugs. And it's okay to have bad bugs because the good bugs, if a balance is, you have a balanced ecosystem, the good will control the bad. Yes, exactly. Oh. And, and that's the thing. You know, we humans tend to... Uh, react to all kinds of bugs and not realize that something might be beneficial or we don't realize that the beneficial insects need to have some of the bad guys to eat otherwise they won't survive so it is it is quite a balance and the goal in my book was to make it easy to identify both the good bugs and the bad bugs that you might see in your garden 
uh, very good information. How can people find uh, your book? And uh, by the way, how can people follow you on your YouTube channel and watch your journey in your garden through this growing season? <laughs> Well, uh, first of all, my book is pretty much available everywhere. You can get it on Amazon or other online sources. You can buy it or have your uh, local independent bookstore order it for you. And uh, my website and blog are on susansinthegarden.com. I have all sorts of great resources for gardeners there. I post daily on Facebook and Instagram. Just look for at Susans in the Garden. And like you mentioned, I have over 300 how-to garden videos on my YouTube channel. And once again, that is Susan's in the Garden. Well, Susan, we greatly appreciate the time and the knowledge you've uh, not only shared with Holly and myself, but all of our listeners. Well, thanks so much for having me as a guest. Well, thank you very much. And when we come back, it's going to be your garden questions, our garden answers. Yes, this is the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show, a program to help your garden grow better. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. ShipDrop is a website you can sign up for free wood chip mulch delivery right to your door. For free, ShipDrop connects homeowners and gardeners with tree services who are trying to get rid of their wood chips. You can also sign up to get free logs and firewood. Go to ShipDrop.com to learn more and sign up for a free account. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit IVOrganics.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. We know that you appreciate the value of a beautifully landscaped yard, but tackling such a project yourself can seem way too complicated, right? Bloomin' Easy Plants are the answer. Their plants are low maintenance and offer exceptional beauty and color for your yard. Plus, they offer free seasonal care reminders with simple how-to videos tailored to the plants that you choose. With Bloomin' Easy on your side, creating the yard that you've always wanted becomes as easy as plant, water, and relax. Check them out at your local garden center or by visiting bloominteasyplants.com. Gardening is the number one hobby and birding is the number two hobby nationwide. They go hand in hand. Birds help gardens grow by eating bad bugs. Reward them with Wild Delights premium quality mixes. Wild Delights premium mixes are made with tasty nuts and berries and not just filler food like Milo and cracked corn. Feed the birds the nutrition they need. This keeps your feathered friends coming back year after year for your visual delight and for the happiness of your garden. Keep your feeders full all year round with Wild Delight premium bird food. Find out more at wilddelight.com. Chapin has the tools to help you this season. We have a wide range of sprayers to help you control pests, weeds, and fertilize your plants. From handheld to ATV sprayers, we have it all. Use our broadcast spreader to feed and seed your green spaces. Water and feed at the same time with our fertilizer injectors. Find Chapin equipment at major home improvement and hardware stores and online at chapinmfg.com. Chapin, cover more ground. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Blue Ribbon Organics, Naturally Green Products, Ironwood Tool Company, Easy Step Products, Rinse Kit, Soul Brew Kabucha, Wild Delight, Rycon Vitova, Chip Drop, Bailbuster.com. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Time for your questions, our answers. If you got a question, you can submit it by sending it to us via email, gardentalkradio at gmail.com, gardentalkradio at gmail.com, or you can give us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-SHOW. Uh, we can go to the hotline. We had a call in from... 
uh, Michigan, listening to us on Wham, 1600 AM and 92.7 FM out of Ann Arbor. Question about moles, voles. Uh, we'll see what, uh, what that is, and we'll see if we can help. Great show. Uh, this is Ilona from Highland, Michigan. Uh, my question is, we have a lot of voles and moles. I, I'm assuming they're one or the other. They're making the little uh, trails in the grass. We have a lot of bare spots in the grass as well, so I'm assuming we have grubs. Now, I applied last month um, Grub Free Zone 3. It's by High Yield to get rid of the grubs, but I know timing is everything. I, I'm not sure how to take care of it. If if this is going to be a one-time thing, because on the bag it says apply once a year. Um, but the voles are, are, like, out of control. I also use the, the worms, the poison worms, which helps, but um, I don't know what to do to get rid of it in the grass. Often. Thank you very much, guys. So, Holly, can we help her with that? We sure can. So... Our biggest thing is to definitely get rid of the grubs. And Which will decrease the moles and voles. Yeah, because um, moles and voles definitely love to eat grubs. I mean, they'll eat worms and stuff like that, but the grubs is like their main their main go, dish. Go to. Yeah. So what we suggested is, and not just because they're a sponsor, but because they it, works. Do, it works for the uh, older grubs as well, not just the larvae, is to use Phylum Bioproducts Grub Gone. That's... Um, at phylum, P-H-Y-L-L-O-M, uh, bioproducts.com, and that's the grub gone. And, yeah, that's going to help take care of it, and then the grass will start to, to grow back and not be patchy. And the moles and bulls will go elsewhere. They'll find someplace else to dine on their dinner. All right, so we thank you for calling in. If you've got a question, you can do just like she did and give us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW, 1-800-927-SHOW. number of so, questions come in through the email, gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Holly, go. So this is a question for you because you like the rhubarb. Right. I have rhubarb seeds. Is it too late to plant them now? Uh, typically, you want to start your rhubarb if you're going to do from seed, which we have about 10 weeks before your uh, last average frost date. However, go ahead and start them now. Uh, you can put them in the ground. One, you know, once you get them uh, a sizable plant, then you can transplant them. So there's nothing wrong. Go ahead and put them, uh, start them now uh, from zones uh, two through eight. If you're in zone nine, 10, 11, any of that area, rhubarb is not going to grow for you. Too warm. Next question, Holly. I'm in zone four, hoping that there is an, uh, there are, are edibles that I can start indoors at this late date? Any uh, suggestions? Thank you for your wisdom. At this point, um, in mid-May, no, mid to end of mid-May, not, not really. But you can buy starts. Otherwise, um, well, I mean, you can start them outdoors, Holly. I mean, she can start tomatoes now and put them in the ground, and then from the time you put them in the ground, I assume oh, it's yeah. a she. Um, that you can start them in the, and put them in the ground at that point. They're in the ground. That's when the but, maturity day starts. Right. But you can direct sow them. Right. Too. Yeah, that's not a problem. I mean, you can start cucumbers two, two weeks before your last average frost date. But at this point, it you know, just go ahead and direct sow by starts. And Holly, you, and we've told this story before, uh, as a child, it was never plant starts. It was four tomatoes. Four tomato seeds went in the ground Memorial Day weekend, and then they developed fruit and grew, and you had tomatoes by and we had tomatoes Labor Day. In, yeah, in yeah, August. Yeah. yeah. Uh, September, Oct or, uh, August, September. I didn't say September. I said August. Well, that one, if you did it right, you would still have <laughs> tomatoes in September. Yeah. 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 Okay, uh, next question. For two years now, I have bought chive seeds and bunching onions from different vendors. They will not germinate. I plant them, wait four weeks, try more seeds. I use a potting soil mix, and uh, nothing comes up. I have planted along other plants, such as flowers, peppers, squash, tomatoes, and they do fine. Why is my chives and bunching onions not growing? Thank you for any suggestions you can give us. So we think it's the seeds. Um, you, it sounds like she has everything else right, the soil, the lights, all of that, moisture levels. Onion, onion seeds do lose germination after a year. Now, there so are some times when you go and buy seeds at a seed company, it will say low germination rate. Like, you know, a normal germination rate, like 90%, uh, 64% germination rate or 50% germination rate. They warn you on the package. And I don't know if that's the case or not. Um, if she's buying new seeds from vendors new each year, 
there's got to be some core some something is there's a there's a puzzle there's piece be missing here yeah there's got to i'm assuming it i don't want to say this but maybe it's something in the soil that i don't that know directly affects the well, it, onion and people do reuse their their grow their uh, seed starting soil year after year. And well, it's possible that- based on the the. I mean, if everything else is growing and it's not the onions, I mean, uh, it could it's be. It's got to be the soil. I think that's that's reacting or, to those onions and, and or too tries. high level of a moisture. Right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, maybe we helped. Maybe we didn't. So uh, take that for what it's worth. <laughs> All right, what's the next so one? So David said he listens to the show via podcast out of Maine and wants to know what books would you recommend on Square Foot Gardening? Well, hello, David. Thank you for tuning in uh, via podcast way up there in the north, in Maine and the north portions of the uh, country. Uh, we would recommend the Mel Bartholomew. I think that's how you say it. Mel Bartholomew. There you go. The uh, Square Foot Gardening uh, book. The, yeah, he's passed now, but it is a phenomenal book that uh, illustrates how you can grow multiple things in one square foot uh Patches. Uh, so, all new square foot gardening uh, by Mel Bartholomew. Okay, so next question is What temperature will shock a tomato plant? I heard that it's too cold, it can shock them. Well, uh, anything below 50 is really a safe number. If you can keep things above 50 degrees soil temperature now, and, and if the soil temperature is 50 degrees or above, the ambient temperature is going to be most likely 50 degrees or above. Now, tomatoes will survive down to 33 degrees. However, we don't want to try to put them in that position. Um, so, you know, if you get to your thir- 40s to 45s and you have the plant in the ground or in a container or you're trying to harden them off, it's going to put them, it's going to, you know, they're going to not be happy. So it's it's uh, kind of don't do it don't do it. Uh, next question is Stacy from northern North Suburb Suburb. Boy, I can't suburbs suburbs. Yeah, I blurred a vision here. Uh, I'm fine. Uh, Illinois here, my home state. I said Illinois, not Illinois. Some people carry that S. They don't need to. <laughs> uh, I love your show. I have learned so much, and I decided to grow San Marzano tomatoes this year, but uh, didn't realize they until I got the package of seeds that they are a semi-determinate variety. I am a new gardener and only grew one indeterminate tomato variety last year, which I tried to prune a single stem to keep it from bushing out too much. Should I do the same with the San Marzano semi-determinate variety, or will pruning them... Uh, lessen the harvest. Any tips would be appreciated. Um, what do you? What would we suggest for them, Holly? For her, Holly? Um, so I would suggest. Well, first of all, explain what a what a uh, determined indeterminate briefly here semi determined is. Sure. So what will happen? Uh, so semi so indeterminate tomatoes like a vine tomato continues to grow and produce tomatoes until you until frost or until you rip it out of the ground. Determinant is like a bush variety. It's going to put on one main fruiting. That's pretty much it. And then semi-determinant is going to put on one main fruiting and then, then at some point going to continue two fruits until... On a slower you, on base. On a slower yeah. rate. Yeah, so it's kind of a, a happy medium. So San, Mar- San Marzano tomatoes are actually typically um, not as high producing as other tomatoes because it technically is an heirloom variety. And it depends on where you're growing them as well. Yeah. Coastal. Right. Yeah. So I would not prune them. It, you, can, I mean, you can prune them, but typically for something like a, a bush tomato, um, you don't typically prune because them. Because you're going to really inhibit the amount yeah. of production that that plant puts out. Because it's in the, in the thought of pruning versus um, not pruning, it's more going to be of the, the bush thought mindset versus the vine every limb you cut off you're losing the potential yeah. six or eight tomato or well you know four to four four or five tomatoes that you're selecting to remove because you're wanting that single stem uh we have found san marzano's do well here at our studio uh because we are very close to lake michigan however at the big garden where you would predominantly see most of our video productions take place which is about mm, what 15 miles from the it's about, I would say, 15 miles southwest. Uh, yeah. uh, of the lake. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, oh, that is about uh, it, nine miles. Mu- much more nine inland. Mi- yeah, nine Half miles mile north. versus yeah. nine miles. And the San Rosanos do not do well there at all because it doesn't have that tropic, not tropical, but that coastal feel with the humidity uh, in the air. They just seem to like that in our experience. Right. Um, so since we live here, 
close to the lake. It does it does have a different climate. And everybody who lives near Lake Michigan or any large body of water pretty knows, in the summer, cold in the winter <laughs> knows that there is that that lake coolness. And um, I like it. I I love living by the lake, but not everybody does. So uh, what else have we got? Uh, with that, we are out of time, Holly. And we thank you for listening, for your time that you allowed us to be part of your day. Did you miss any portion of this show or want to revisit it in its entirety? Well, you can do that by going to our parent website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com, and clicking on the Season 5 tab at the top of the page. Or you can send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com, and we will send you the link to this show via podcast. Uh, tune in next week. Do not miss it. We will be covering fertilizer, the types of fertilizer out there available for your garden, what you should and should, should not purchase, and some of the reasons and techniques on how to apply it and the best to get the best bang for the buck, as well as we will be talking about bug control in your garden. Our guest will be new author Gary Pulaski of The Rustic Garden, and we'll answer your garden questions. So until next week for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden.